want you to turn with me to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 24. The Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 24. We're going to begin reading in verse 3. Before we get into that, I want to greet all of you that are watching online. We, guys, it was, it was, it's amazing to me. We're getting letters from people watching from North Dakota and Ohio and Kentucky. And it's just, it's awesome to see. As a matter of fact, I received an email from a brother that's in Shreveport that watches our services every week. And it blesses me to see that our ministries are accomplishing that, that which is being sent forth to do. Amen. We're ministering to people literally around the nation. And I'm grateful for that. Um, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 3. We're going to be continuing our Keys of the Kingdom series today. So I want you to look with me at verse 3. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end shall be saved. Verse 14, I want to draw all of our attention to this morning. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end shall come. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. Two Sundays ago, we began our new series on keys of the kingdom. The first Sunday, I dealt with right living and the standard of expectation that the Scripture defines for each one of us individually as far as those who were called unto Christ. Last Sunday, I dealt with conflict mitigation and how should the church navigate conflict whenever issues arise? Because things happen because all of us are human. Shout amen. Things are going to arise, but there is still a standard of expectation for the church when it comes to managing issues such as that. But today I want to make a little bit of a transition from speaking to kingdom culture, and I want to talk about some kingdom authority today, kingdom authority. Over the next two Sundays, today being included, I'm going to be walking us through what does the Scripture say about the power of Christ and the dominion of Christ and the glory of God being poured out into the earth. So to not delay our point this morning, I'm going to jump right into this. Point number one for our time together today. The gospel of the kingdom has a global mission that is directly connected to the return of Christ. I'm going to say that again. The gospel of the kingdom has a global mission that is directly connected to the return of Christ. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, what does it say? And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout what? The whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, the gospel of the kingdom, whenever we think about the gospel, we may think about different things that may lend to our perspective or insight concerning the gospel message and what it's done for us individually. It is the gospel message that lends to our testimony of faith in Christ and our subsequent forgiveness of sins. Granted, yes, it is the sacrifice of Christ on the cross that opens the proverbial door for us to be able to have our names written in the Lamb's book of life. But what if, what if and just bear with me here, what if the gospel was, was far more of a bigger message than just fire insurance? 
What if the gospel message was far more than just salvation? What if there was a second work, or as, as it were, the Holy Ghost? What if there was a greater calling than just getting saved and sitting back and waiting for heaven to come to call? What if there's something bigger than just that? Now, now, furthermore, I want us to understand that what if the gospel was the very same avenue by which the God of heaven and earth would empower a broken humanity to be endued with the glory of God, to be an emissary of the gospel, an ambassador of Christ, and not just a byproduct of the gospel. Furthermore, there are so many Christians that are praying and begging for Jesus to return and people are talking about setting dates for the rapture and all of these things. But I would like to suggest that if the end of the age is directly connected and correlated and ultimately predicted, predicated rather, upon the church preaching and demonstrating the very gospel of the kingdom under the ends of the world and then the end shall come, it would seem that the church is waiting on heaven but ultimately heaven is waiting on the church. We are begging Jesus to come back and Jesus is demanding his church to step up. This gospel of the kingdom must be proclaimed to the ends of the world and then the end shall come. Well, pastor, what about that bleeding over into the imminent return of Christ? Dear friends, the gospel of the kingdom is going around the world. What Jesus predicted in Matthew 24 has us literally standing on the very threshold of Christ's return, but there's still work yet to do. Furthermore, we, we must understand that we are not waiting for heaven to move. Heaven has empowered us with the promise of the Father, and heaven is expecting us to be about the Father's business and to preach and demonstrate the very gospel of the kingdom. Today, I want to drill down, if you will, on the authority of the kingdom and what that means from a biblical perspective, because I would dare to venture that most Christians in general, and it's amazing to me that Mary got up and prophesied what she did about how we don't understand the power of our words and how it's important for us to, as, 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 the, as the faith of a mustard seed, speak into a mountain and it moving. I want you to listen to what I wrote today. I would dare to venture that most Christians in general have no idea of just how much untapped power that we have in our lives that heaven wants to activate to be conduits of the glory and the presence of God in the earth. We're begging heaven to move and heaven is at standby going, I wish the church would do something that we can respond to. I'm looking for somebody in the earth that I might show myself mighty on their behalf. And as far as I'm concerned, let the glory begin to outpour right here at 102 Blanchard Street. Can I get an honest amen today? Untapped power. Point number two today, the gospel of the kingdom has the very power over everything that is anti-kingdom. I'm going to say that again. The gospel of the kingdom has the power over everything that is anti-kingdom. I want you to take, for example, the two following passages found in the gospel of St. Matthew that gives us some insight into what the gospel of the kingdom is and its subsequent impact upon society when it is decreed. Decreed. Some people got it twisted a few weeks ago. I need to talk through something. I am not a name it and claim it, blab it and grab it preacher. I don't believe in that. However, I do believe, according to the Bible, that we had better watch our words because they have creative power. For example, what you speak on your children, they will manifest. Because could it be that you're prophesying more than you're speaking? A speaking spirit. That's what God created in Adam in the beginning and he gave Adam the authority listen now the Bible says that in the beginning was the Word the Word was with God the Word was God and the Word was made manifest to dwell amongst men that's John's explanation of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 however what does the Bible say in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2 whenever God is creating he does what he speaks and God said, let there be. And God said, let there be. And God said, let there be. Why? Because his word had power. 
And if he's given us his word, come on somebody, we can decree a matter with authority, not because we are almighty, but because we know his word shall not return unto him void. I'll give you a perfect example of this. Well, I don't believe in this whole decreeing thing. Well, then why did you even pray for salvation? You were decreeing a matter. Out of the words of the mouth and the belief in the heart, a man believes unto salvation. It's more than just a thought process or a state of the heart. It is a what? A decree. It is a statement. It is something that must come out of your mouth. Is it not interesting that whenever Peter denies Jesus, he was doing what? He was making a decree. I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. And what did Jesus make him do? He made him reverse his words to break the curse that his words had brought upon himself. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? He asked him three times to get Peter's words to change. So what we speak, what comes out of our mouth is going to manifest in some way, shape, form, or fashion. It may even manifest in you by your attitude. The gospel of the kingdom has the power over everything that is anti-kingdom. The Bible says in the book of Job, you shall decree a matter and it shall be done. Jesus said these works, what? You shall do and you shall do them greater. So is it arrogant for me to say that word and say, well, Jesus said that the works that we've seen him do, that I shall do them and do them greater. Is that a self-righteous statement? No, I'm standing on the authority of the word of what Jesus promised me. That's not a self-righteous statement. That is an authoritative statement. I know what he said and what? I set myself in agreement with it. Imagine someone dying and you're written into the will and a lawyer comes and reads the will and he says, listen, the deceased has given legal transaction for you to receive a million dollars. You have to what? What? Set yourself in agreement with that to receive from that. Because if you say, I don't want that, I don't need that, I don't receive that, guess what? It will not be transferred. Why do you think that the Bible says the Lord is looking for somebody in the earth to show himself mighty what? On their behalf. He's looking for somebody to agree with him. To get in a divine alignment with him to decree a matter into the earth. Why do you think Jesus said, let your will, what, be done on as it is currently being done in? So that means that we have a responsibility to ensure his will is manifested here. And most in generally, it comes out of what comes out of our mouth. We have to be careful what we say. For example, I don't believe in decreeing. Well, then why do you believe in, in prophecy in the church? Why do you believe in praying? If a decree is authority from the mouth, then prayer is authority from the mouth. Well, if it's arrogant to decree, then why do you pray? Because apparently God doesn't listen. Do you see? Do you see how the enemy tries to take something that Christ has established and twist it? And the enemy tries to to pervert it to keep us from walking in in that authority. my, My notes are gone today. Jesus said this, what? He said, I do nothing lest I have first, what? Seen my father do it. I say nothing, words. I decree nothing into the earth lest I've, what? First heard my father say it. Heaven speaking, the father was speaking in what was happening. The son was responding. The Father was speaking. The Son is responding. Do you think Jesus just walked around and just inanimately healed people for no reason? He said, I do these things because I'm under instruction to do it. I speak these things because I'm under the authority to speak these things. So if we have an issue with with the term decree, 
then let's just flip that and say we're going to set ourselves in agreement with what the master is saying and we're what? We're going to echo that. Had a recent meeting with, with a brother in the church and we were discussing this scripture. The Bible says that, that the sword of the Spirit, that the word of the Lord is a what? A two-edged sword dividing soul from flesh, dividing bone from marrow. If, if we're pretty well familiar with that scripture. Look at it in the Greek. It doesn't say double-edged. It says double-mouthed. The word says, don't do this. I confess, therefore I don't. I set myself in alignment with what the word says. I decree what the scripture says over me. As he is, so am I in this world. Is that a self-righteous statement? No, that's what the Bible says. Mother Burke, my gospel, my, my gospel, what was she doing? She was taking the word and decreeing it over herself. Just as in a legal transaction, you have to set yourself in agreement with a ruling to receive the ruling. You have to set yourself in agreement with the word to receive from the word. If you won't set yourself in agreement with the word on salvation, you won't be saved. If you don't set yourself in agreement with the word of healing, then you won't be healed. If you don't set yourself in agreement that the Bible says that we have the promise of salvation down to a thousand generations in our family, then we will not receive that. Why? Not because heaven doesn't want to do it, but because we won't receive it. Everybody with me today? Whenever we read the Word, it's more than just reading the Word so we can quote Scripture. We are what? We are divinely aligning ourselves with the Word to receive. You can get in the shower and never get wet. The spout can be on. The temperature can be just right. But you can be in the shower and not get wet. You can be in the church and never receive from Christ. People say, well, I don't feel God because you're not engaged. It amazes to me, some people, they're all in. God's all over them. Three persons down, they look like, they, they look like that they've lived off of lemons and limes all week long. <laughs> One person's getting a healing and the other person's mad and offended. Come on, somebody. We can be in his presence and not receive. Do you think that all those people that were thronging around Jesus with the woman with the issue of blood, that some of them didn't have sickness? Why is it that one received and the other ones didn't? Everybody was touching him. Even the disciples said, what do you mean who touched you? You not see all these people? Everybody touching you. That tells me that we can touch Jesus and still not be changed. Why? Because we're not setting ourselves in agreement in alignment with what it says. Now, I understand that people have perverted it and all of that, and I get that. But I'm trying to get us back to what, what does the Word say? Come on, somebody. What, what does the Word say? In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23, and there's no way I'm going to finish this message today. Did y'all bring some sandwiches today? I'm only on page 4 of, of 11 pages, and it's 1121. Y'all going to fast today. <laughs> Bless His holy name. Now I promise uh, look, I understand that there's a, there's a fine line between a hostage situation and a long sermon, right? <laughs> Y'all can breathe. I'm going to have to finish it next week. The Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23, what does it say? And when he went throughout all Galilee, shout all, teaching in their synagogues, notice plural, and proclaiming what? The Gospel of the Kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they what? Brought him what? All the sick. Those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those who have seizures, and those who, who are paralytics, and what? And he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, from beyond the Jordan. I want you to note that the gospel of the kingdom was proclaimed, that healings are manifested and the afflictions cease. 
And from the manifestation of the glory of God, stories begin to spread throughout that region and more and more and more people kept coming. Why? Because they needed heal healings from sicknesses and diseases and pains and demonic oppressions and seizures and the paralyzed. Again, when the gospel of the kingdom is decreed, the glory of God begins to manifest and drives out everything that is anti-kingdom. My prayer, Father, we decree, I decree as the under-shepherd over this house that the glory of God is going to fill this house like like the waters cover the seas. Not for our glory, not for our elevation, not for our attention. I want the glory of God to invade this place because I want to see what Jesus walked in whenever he preached that very same gospel of the kingdom. I want to see those who were oppressed by, by demons to be uh, healed and, 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 and cancers and all of these things. I want to see people get, get out of wheelchairs. Not so that we can do a commercial and say, come to the church where all the miracles are happening. No, no, no. I want the glory of God here because it's the byproduct of preaching the very gospel of the kingdom. I want to see miracles and power and glory and wonders upon this house. I, I've read in our historical archives about our church whenever we had a brush arbor and the power of God was so strong upon that tent meeting they thought the building was on fire. And the firemen would show up with, 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 back in, we're talking 80, 90 years ago, with fire trucks ready to put out a fire. And it wasn't a fire. Come on, somebody. It was the Lord. I want to see that. Dear hearts, we were birthed out of that. We were birthed out of that. This church was birthed out of that. We're not going to lose that. It's what birthed us. And if it was... And if it was necessary to birth us, come on, somebody, it's going to be necessary to sustain us. I want the gospel of the kingdom preached. I want the glory of God outpoured in this house. I want, listen, hearts, friends, I want, I want the glory of God to be so strong on this property that Glenwood can't even fill a room. I want it to be so strong on, on this property that whenever people show up, nobody even lays hands on them. The glory of God is here so powerfully that just gorders and cancers and tumors just fall off of their bodies. Why? Not for my glory and not for yours, but because I want to see the people of God touched. I'm tired of reading about it, and I'm tired of hearing people talk about it. I want to see it. I want to see it. I, I want to see it in this room. I, I, I want to see it so powerfully that every person in this room is smacked upon their face before the presence of God and nobody can move. I want to see it. It's happening everywhere else around the world. Why isn't it happening here? Because it's not being decreed. It's not being spoken. It's not being led into. I want it. I want it. I want it because, here, listen to me, there are some things as your pastor I can't fix, but I know the glory can. There are some things that I can't counsel you out of, but I know that the glory of God can fix it. There may be things that I don't have an answer to, but I know that the glory of God can open the door. I may not be able to lay hands on you and heal you, but I know a great physician. Come on, somebody. I want the glory of the Lord. I want the glory of the Lord. I need to land this plane. And I'm just getting wound up. We're going to need to go to two-hour services. I'm kidding. Can I just slow down and just teach on this point? And we're going to wrap up together. And then y'all got to be here for next Sunday for me to preach for two hours. Bring a sandwich. The Gospel of St. Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 14, gives us insight into the manifestation of the power of the gospel of the kingdom by the very words of Christ himself. Again, am I not reading you what Jesus said? Matthew 4 is what Jesus was teaching. Here in Luke, check this out. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. But some of them said he cast out demons by the help of Beelzebub, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. The man just made a mute, demon-possessed man sane and talk, and they're still asking for a miracle from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, 
Every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan is also divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. But if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Come on, somebody. By whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Dear friends, stop chasing miracles. We have to understand that according to the Scripture, that the manifestation of miracles and the power of God is the byproduct of the gospel of the kingdom being taught and being preached and being declared and being spoken over us and being decreed over us. Why? Because the gospel of the kingdom must be what? Spoken. Whenever I get in this, and when, when I'm, I'm getting ready to wrap up, I promise, if I can have my musicians to come. Everybody all right? Y'all got two sermons today. Y'all got an encouragement sermon, and then y'all got a, king, a, a keys of the kingdom message. Come on, somebody. Y'all got a two for one today. Bless his holy name. Whenever Jesus is dealing with this issue, they're making it about manifesting more miracles. He's trying to draw them back to the key. He's casting out demons by the help of Beelzebub. Wait a minute. If I cast out demons by the finger of God, then you know that the kingdom has come unto you. Why? Because the gospel of that kingdom had been decreed. It had been declared. It had been spoken. One of the most heartbreaking passages of Scripture in the entire New Testament is when it says that Jesus worked not many much miracles amongst them because of their unbelief. They literally had the key of their breakthrough present, and because they dishonored that key, they had no access to what it unlocked. And friends, it takes us setting ourselves in agreement with heaven for heaven to access the earth and it all begins with what we say for example if i'm praying for you what am i doing i'm decreeing healing into your body because of what the scripture says lord your word says that healing is the children's bread and it is your good privilege to give good gifts unto your children because you're the good father. I call you into account of what your word says. And because your word says it, I decree it to manifest from heaven into the earth. As I shared a few weeks ago, in Daniel chapter 9, what happens? Daniel, the prophet, reads a prophecy of a dead prophet of Jeremiah prophetically speaking about the 70 years of captivity and what happens Daniel starts to pray the will of God that had been prophesied Lord you said 70 years through the prophet and I'm calling you into remembrance of that today and what happened the moment Daniel released the word the angel comes to him and what does the angel say the moment you said the word I was dispatched to you with an answer why it wasn't because Daniel was righteous it wasn't because Daniel was God's first cousin it was because Daniel understood two things he understood the authority of the word and he understood the power of speaking it can, can I go a little deeper here before I close the Roman centurion comes to Christ and what does he say I have one of my household that is sick unto death and he needs a healing. Jesus says, take me to him. The, 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 and the centurion responds and says, I'm not worthy to have you under my roof. But if you will but what? Speak the word, my servant will be healed. Because I am a man under authority as you. 
I understand the power of my words. I tell this one to go and he does. I tell this other one to come to me, he does. And because I'm a man under authority, I'm the, I understand the power. Listen now, I understand the power of the words that are in your mouth because you have greater authority than I. If you will but speak the word, my servant will be healed. And what did Jesus say? No greater faith has been found in all of Israel, lest it be by this Gentile. What? That simply understands the power of declaring the word. Jesus speaks the word. The centurion goes home. A servant comes out to meet that centurion. He's healed. When did it happen? And it happened in the moment he said it in the framework of time. Dear hearts, I believe that one of the greatest untapped resources that needs to be released into the earth is our words of speaking the kingdom into existence. Imagine the impact that the kingdom, not the assembly, the kingdom, the church at large, imagine the impact that we would have if we simply learn the value of harnessing our words and divinely aligning ourselves with what the Word of God says for our lives. We can read it, but until we speak it over ourselves, we can read about salvation. But until we speak that over ourselves, we can read about healing, but until we speak that over ourselves, we can read about the power of the Holy Ghost, but until we speak that, isn't it unique that the first thing that God takes under arrest is your mouth? The moment the Holy Ghost invades your life, the initial physical evidence of what? Speaking! Why? Because the Holy Ghost is aware of the power that comes out of your mouth. Sometimes we have to speak over ourselves beyond what our situation is. It may look like this, but come on somebody. We speak things that are not as though they were until they are. Speaking the power of the kingdom and trusting heaven to take up the slack. The kingdom of heaven is getting ready to pour out an unbelievable manifestation of the glory of God in this church. I believe with every ounce of my being that the 24-hour prayer meeting that we just had literally was the launching pad for this rocket ship called the assembly to take off and to start to breach into the heavens. I believe that we're going to look back at the end of this year and be blown away at what God has done in and through this church. But it takes all of us speaking and worshiping. Isn't it amazing that when we decree and worship, when we worship the Lord, notice everything, worship, prayer, de decreeing, reading, speaking the word, it all involves what? Your mouth. Isn't it amazing how when we really get into worship, the atmosphere changes? Notice the engagement of worship determines the outpouring in presence. Why? Because the Bible says that he's enthroned upon the praises of his people. Church family, the glory is coming. And we're just starting to see what it can do in and through us as a church. Why do you think I'm teaching on this? I'm trying to get us ready. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to get us ready so whenever the master manifests in the way that I know that he's about to, we're ready for it.